when trauma occurs, the brain stores whatever happened in the right brain and it reacts every time it sees that again. But whenever we are frightened by something, that's our right brain, we say, I feel frightened. We're connecting to our left brain, where Broca's area is, our speech center. And that then immediately deflates the fear. It's for all of us, it's allowing ourselves to acknowledge our feelings. What happens when we're children is it's don't be frightened. No, you don't be so angry. I will not have you shouting. Don't be this, you know. Parents don't want their children to feel fear or anger or even sadness. It's like, don't cry, darling. I'll get you another toy. We should be saying, it's okay. It's sad you've lost your toy. Let's let go of that sadness. Just sit, let's sit there and cry until you've let it all go. Do you have irrational triggers such as anger or fear over seemingly small things like maybe spiders or running late? Do you suffer mental health conditions like depression or anxiety? Or have you experienced childhood trauma? Or as a parent, how can we support our children in releasing these potential traumas? to avoid them growing into huge triggers when they're older. How do we support them through this? Hi, I'm Nicole Sharanum, and today I have the pleasure of chatting with Liz Mulliner, who offers a life-changing simple solution to many of our adult fears, angers, and triggers. Join us as we delve into trauma and how what we can perceive as a child can really impact our lives as adults. Liz Mulliner is the founder of Heal for Life Foundation, and she's authored four books, including Heal for Life, a guidebook detailing her knowledge from over 20 years of supporting survivors of childhood trauma to heal. She was awarded an Order of Australia in 1997, a Centenary Medal in 2000, and honoured on This Is Your Life in 2001. She was awarded the first Humanitarian Award in 2003. In 2010, Liz was a New South Wales finalist for the Australian of the Year Local Hero. So without further ado, let's get into it now, folks. Hi, Liz. How are you? Good. Lovely to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much for being here with us today on Connectedly. It's lovely to meet you. I haven't met you before. I have heard a lot about you and I'm very much looking forward to having this discussion with you. Oh. So I, I won't go too much into what you do because I would love to hear in your words because you're going to be able to describe what you do a lot better than I am. So please tell us what it is that you do. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, when I discovered I was a survivor of child abuse, I discovered that there were very few health professionals really understanding what it was to be a survivor or how to help us to heal. And to cut a very long story short, I therefore originally started a charity called ASCA, now called the Blue Knot Foundation. Um, but I discovered that was about meeting and groups and more advocacy. And I realized my passion was about healing people. So uh, it led me to opening a center. Uh, so that survivors could come, a safe place where survivors could come to heal from their own abuse, only run by survivors. So I realized the only people who really understood survivors were people who'd been through it themselves. And I also realized that to do that, I'd have to do a lot of training myself because I was in the film industry. So I then undertook, you know, getting a master's in counseling <clears throat> and really learning about the brain. And we developed very early stages of program. It's a one-week program and over 10,000 people have been now and it runs in the Philippines and in England as well as in Australia. And basically my passion is telling people that whatever you're suffering from, whether it's poor relationships, addictions, anything, look at your childhood and you can heal from it. So nobody can say, oh, I'm just the way I am because I'm the way I am. Everybody can change because the brain is plastic. So now what I do is mostly train psychologists and therapists um, and our own teams uh, to help people to heal effectively from childhood trauma. <clears throat> and my passion is for people to know that they can heal. And if they've been healing for 20 years and they haven't got anywhere, they're not healing with the right person. Wow. <laughs> it's like a mic drop moment there, isn't it? <laughs> so so I, I want to delve a little bit more into this. So. I know you've said childhood trauma. Can you define what trauma is? Because you very know, very important. 
Yeah, there's lots of people that might say, but I haven't got trauma on a big scale. It doesn't matter. It's not, trauma, scientifically defined, trauma is any moment when there is more emotion than you can handle, which overwhelms the ability to adapt, and at that age is perceived as life-threatening. A baby, a tiny baby at six months old, if mummy doesn't come when they cry, it can be perceived as life-threatening or if they're not fed. Now, anyone will still say, okay, so you had a terrible childhood or your mum left you when you were three months old. That's it, being judgmental. Everyone's different, but the smallest thing, if it fulfills those things of being more emotional than someone can deal with, overwhelming the brain's ability to adapt. And the brain goes into a survival strategy, which profoundly impacts on that person's life for the rest of their life, unless they choose to heal from the trauma by going back and releasing the fear that that baby, that two-year-old, that 10-year-old, that 20-year-old felt at the time. And when we hold fear in our brain, in what's called the amygdala, then all the time, whenever we are reminded through our senses of that trauma, we react as if the trauma is actually happening. So we do what is called triggered, which means we react in a way where our prefrontal cortex, a thinking part of our brain, is no longer active because of the stress hormones being released. And so we behave in irrational, unfortunate ways, which we may not even be aware of, but can be very, very detrimental to life. And nobody can know what their trauma is, or even often don't even know what they're that they're triggered. So it's not something, you go, oh, well, I know. You, you can't know because the trauma is stored in your unconscious brain. It's a very succinct, quick kind of explanation. So, for instance, I started healing at the age of 50, having, as I thought, a perfect childhood. And it was only like two years into recovery and the, the Women's Weekly that serialized the story of my life because I'd written my autobiography. And my psychologist rang up and said, I know what your trigger was, which started you off on your healing list. And I said, oh, do you? Oh, I've always wondered what it was. It suddenly meant I suddenly started getting all these memories. And she said, yes, you were rushed to hospital to witness the birth of my niece. And when I was five, I was rushed to hospital and then was sexually abused for a week by, it was one of my things, by a doctor in a hospital. So I didn't even recognize the trigger, even when I started going to a psychologist, even when she uncovered it. So we can often not know, but they can have a profound impact. So from that first triggering, actually, I was ill for eight weeks, really seriously ill because I was so dissociative. So also it's <clears throat> when we get triggered, our body, our brain reacts to try and get us to remember what the actual trauma was. I, I think for the first time since doing this podcast, I feel speechless. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> because it, it's hard to grasp what you're saying because it's so huge that huge. I mean, it is huge. So is it possible then that, that let's say I have a trigger that, um, you know, I react because whatever, something random that seems so silly at the time, but yep. I just, I react. Yep. That could, could be. Absolutely. Something if you have an irrational, if you have an irrational fear. So even quite recently, one of my grandchildren and he's 14 and he was being, he, so frightened of spiders. And I was saying, oh, for goodness sake, you're 14. It's a spider. And then suddenly I thought, oh, maybe he's triggered by a spider. And I suddenly said, oh, gosh, I think I made, oh, so sorry, John. I think I've made an awful mistake. Do you, would you like me to find out when you were first frightened of a spider? And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I took 15 minutes, took it, it went back. And when he was one, there was a spider above his cot or bed. And obviously his mum came in, screamed, there's a spider, there's a spider, to which the baby went, thinks, this is a life-threatening thing, this spider. So he, that was a trauma. It was more than he could deal with. His mum was frightened, overwhelmed his ability to adapt. Now, that's all that happened in his childhood. All he had was an irrational fear of spiders, which he no longer has. Once you have released the fear, then you are no longer captive. Mm. And it's the triggering that is so, has such an impact on survivors of trauma, sends them into the fight, flight, freeze response. So many survivors do things like move house 15 times. They haven't realized that they are in flight. People have migraines, not all migraines, but migraines can be caused as the way they are trying, their system is trying to say, 
there is danger, there is danger, and it creates a headache. So we all have different ways of what we do when we have the fight, flight, freeze response, but it's recognizing that it's a trigger. It's not that we've just got a stupid fear of spiders or mm. it is. Which is often what we do as adults. We squash what we're feeling and, and go, oh, don't be silly. That's right. And everybody else says, don't be silly. And then the person thinks, why am I, why can't I get over this? This is stupid. If I give you another example, these are people who have not suffered from trauma. Um, so my darling niece and I, we were, were taking a whole lot of grandchildren to Sovereign Hill in, in Australia, a mining place. And there lots of the stuff is going underground. And she said, oh, Liz, I've, I, you know, I can't go in lifts anymore. She said, I, I, I've got real agoraphobia. I can't be in closed spaces. She said, it's get, been getting worse and worse. And I said, oh. And then we were going to get in this train, which was going to take us down to the workings of the, the original mine. And she suddenly had a full-on panic attack. And we've got six small, you know, children of various ages. And uh, so I had to say to the kids, wait here. So I said to my dear niece, niece Rachel, I said, let's just go back to the hotel. So with her, and you had to get her into a right brain via a visualization, or you can do it by drawing with your non-dominant hand, but connecting with the right unconscious brain. And she then remembered, she was either eight or nine. She was at a birthday party and all the kids fell on top of her. Sort of thing kids can do at a party. You know, a whole mass of kids. At the bottom, she thought she was going to die. It was more emotion than she could dealt with. Overwhelmed her ability to adapt. So when she got to that, I got her to release all the fear, terror. Oh, I'm going to die under here. Terrifying. Mm. And then we do what we call re-empower. Anyone can do this at home. This isn't some secret thing. I want the world to know. And then she empowered the little girl. So what she did was she made her little girl grow really, really tall. And the little girl said to all the girls, you were all horrid. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have laid on me. That wasn't fair. I was really, really scared. And then she did what we call nurturing. So then she just sort of loved her, her own little girl and said, it's okay. You know, things like that happen. This whole thing took maybe 15 minutes. Okay. We went back, the kids all clustered around waiting for, you know, we got the next train all the way down. Rachel was laughing. She was saying, my God, I'm not having a panic attack. What's happened? This is unbelievable. I am no longer frightened. I am no longer. I'm a she was so stunned that su such a simple thing and it was becoming really affecting her mm. because, you know, if you can't get into a lift and you don't want to go down underground and she's never had it since. So it's what people have to realize is I often say, if you've got a, if you've got a reaction to something that's not reasonable, childhood trauma, it can be a multitude of things. It can also be really horrific child sexual abuse, child emotional abuse, um, a drug addicted parent being adopted and your adoptive parents may be absolutely wonderful but the baby in the womb has learnt their mother's voice. So they're born and suddenly the mother's voice goes. So of course it's a trauma. And it doesn't matter how wonderful the adopted mother is, the child has this sense of loss. Mm. So it's just a matter of, again, it takes no time at all for them to go back and grieve and feel frightened and release the fear of where's mummy. And then all that, that grieving, that feeling that something's not quite right goes. Mm. So it's, it's not complicated. And everyone seems to make everything so complicated. You know, they're all full of this, this theory or that theory or this, mm. sy this system. Or, and, and it's all very long. And, and it, it's as if the world is frightened of letting people just safely go back, to whatever it is, and let go of it. That's all nature mm. wants us to do. Well, people are often afraid to do that, aren't they? They are, but, um, and there are things like I train therapists because that, like the add out part of the self has to always stay there. So nobody, nobody should ever go back into their childhood as it were without their add out self being present. So there are, of course, you can't just, it, it, there are of course things to be, to be careful and safe, safe about absolutely. Mm. But no emotion is over, overwhelmed. People are frightened. Emotions will overwhelm them. A lot of therapists are frightened to take, in case it overwhelms them. Well, in 30 years, I've never seen anyone overwhelmed because when you release an emotion, it's no longer there. But if you mm. hold on, oh, I'm so frightened and got to breathe it out. Mm. Breathe yeah. out the fear. You know, and it, the same applies, the same principle of how the brain works applies for, say, someone who's frightened of being on a plane. 
remember with, with some do I was talking, someone said, oh my goodness, I, I've just realized I de-triggered myself without realizing it on a plane. And she said, I didn't know why that flight was the only flight that was okay. And she said, you know what I did? I turned to the neighbor next to me and said, I'm so frightened of flying. And that's how you de-trigger. That's not through the process, but just to get rid of the fear. And if you say, I feel frightened, breathe it out and really let it go. Then the brain goes, okay, the adult part of the brain, as it were, simplistically, the left brain is in charge. Everything's okay. And they let it go. So solving detriggering and healing is really quite easy. Mm. So I'm often thinking, how can I get everyone to know this and start practicing it and not endlessly talk about their, their trauma, talk about their abuse or run away from it because it's too much. I can't, I can't, I can't go there. That this is, this is too big for me and say, no, it isn't. If, if your adult is happy to go back, nothing unsafe happening in your life now. Mm. It's all, you've lived it. Mm. So you say it's simple and obviously you have, um, you know, you've got therapists that you said you've trained. And you said that we can do these things at home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, so people can do it at home, but they, but they like people who've been on healing weeks and, mm. and being to, they need to understand a few safety principles. Yeah. But in a sense, if anyone can do it at home, their adult self is there. So therefore they're not going to regress. Do you see what I mean? It's a, it's your own self-protection. If you can do it for yourself then it's yours because your adult self is there holding you. Does that make sense? It because, does. It does. So, um, so you, you run in person weeks? Mm -hmm. Is that what, are they in person? We, uh, we have like five day healing weeks, which people come to in Australia and England and the Philippines. Um, and people come there and they may just uncover one trauma. The main thing they learn is exactly what happens to the brain so that there's, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just the way their brain reacted to what was happening and it's healable and changeable. They also learn that, um, uh, they learn how to de-trigger and they learn that they can heal. I, I think everyone would say what they get from the week is hope and a path forward rather than a, oh yeah, that was good. And then uh, three weeks later, oh, well, I'm back to feeling the way I felt before, which you know, there's so many things make you feel a bit better for a minute. And I, to me, I'm only interested in people healing permanently. I, I want people to reclaim their lives, yeah. you know, move on. <laughs> Don't want to be stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuck and, and prisoner, a prisoner. Yeah. Prisoner to, to your, the people who hurt you in childhood. Right. And I almost feel like as you speak about, you know, what trauma is and, and these experiences, they all seem so, I mean, <clears throat> not, not all of the ones that you have said have been hugely dramatic you know they might be something small um like you know feeling like you're just perceiving that you've been abandoned even if you actually haven't been like being left at school when you're a kid you know your mum's just actually running but, late but, yeah just let being left at school as a kid would be unlikely to feel life-threatening if you were five or okay. six okay okay so it's a girl has a cognizant ability to know mum says she's coming back and she's had okay. experience of mum coming back so I think one when I'm saying it's age appropriate okay so often it's the younger. So it's a, a lot, a, a lot of stuff can happen in the one, when you're one or two, before your left brain starts to develop. Mm -hmm. That's when, if you think about it, anything can be overwhelming. Yeah. And when you get to five or six or 10, then it probably is something, what we would call a trauma. Mm. Probably say. So I kind of feel like now that there'd be a huge percentage of this world walking around with quite a lot of trauma. I just was looking at the World Health Organization statistics. Oh, shit. gosh, my brain is hopeless. I was doing training um, yesterday online. It's, I think it's 71% the World Health Organization said. If you think about it, a lot of people have, like the example, minor traumas. So it's, mm. it's, to me, all this stuff should just be known as if you've got a, a fear of something, an abnormal fear, then that's what you do. It's a sort of mm. simple process. It's like not taking a Panadol, but sort of that simple. Mm. Yet I train psychologists everywhere and they're always going, oh my God, oh, oh, it's so simple. Oh, and then, you know, I do supervision and they go, I can't believe it, Liz. This is just so, so simple and, and it works. And, and you know, 
then they use their other tools. Of course, they've got other tools that, that, that need to be used. This is just how to get rid of your core trauma. Then mm. you can look at other things in, your, in the way you behave in life. So, so can children be treated as well or do they have to wait to? And yeah. tiny children, yeah. um, I always uh, uh, teach the mothers because tiny children, the person they most trust is their mum. So <clears throat> their mum can heal them. That's so much better than trying to get a child to go to a therapist where the therapist has to make the kid feel safe. Whereas a little kid will very, and it doesn't have all the layers that we have. So had um, two been sexually abused by his grandfather in a bathroom. And um, he, he was kept, and the mum said to me, he's just so frightened of going in the bathroom. I said, well, next time you just say to him, okay, do you want to just breathe out that fear? You don't want to keep on that scariness of being in a bathroom, do you? It's so scary. So the kids said, oh, I'm so scared because grandpa did this, this, this in the bathroom. So he let it go. Mum said, that's okay. It's not going to happen again. I'm going to protect you. Just breathe out all that fear. And did what I'm talking about. And then the little kid could go in the bathroom. So mums with tiny children are the best people to heal them. If they're not, mm-hmm. the, of course, if not, they're, if they're not abusive. I mean, I'm, I'm meaning a mum who wants, wants to help a kid. So, but we run our kids camps in the age of eight, because that's the age at which we feel we can help a kid feel safe and be able, and, and they are much easier to get to their trauma than teenagers or adults. The layers of not wanting to, they haven't got all the, stuff that we all build on top yeah. haven't got yeah. the, fear, the fear that adults have so my daughter's five and a half now oh. and i'm now thinking oh gosh i hope i haven't given my child trauma <laughs> it's just look you know you I, I think it, it i don't think mothers can be blamed if something like there's a spider in a room any of us would scream there's a spider or there's a snake careful of the snake i mean it's kind of natural isn't it and, mm. and I, this is not a about blaming even very dysfunctional parents. Every parent does the best they can, you know. They, mm. Nobody wants to be a bad parent. Everybody, but some people have the impediments of their own childhoods and they don't know what, what to do. So it's not about blaming parents at all. It's about mm. everybody just being aware that if there are things that are not okay in their life, that they can change it. So if you're, you know, consistent, but I'm sure you are a secure mum, you're, you're, you're your kid is going to be absolutely fine. But if suddenly she was really over, over, overly sensitive or overreacting to something, then you just say to her, breathe out the fear. You're frightened. You're frightened as a monster under the red dime. Just breathe out the fear because you don't want to be frightened of a monster, do you? And do you want me to get the monster out from the bed? Do you want to tell the monster to get out? I mean, you can do it with kids because mm. it's the brain needs one to acknowledge the fear. So you can do it in if the kids, if there isn't really a monster under the bed. Mm. principle but for so much now but until recently if a kid is frightened the parent will say you don't have to be frightened there's nothing to be frightened of so they negate the fear the child is feeling don't they mm. it's so loud mum it's so you don't have to be frightened of the loud noise don't be silly if it, there's lots of loud it, it's we don't allow often children to acknowledge their fear and say yeah it's very very scary breathe out the scary because You've still got to stand here alongside the noisy car. So it's kind of like you're still going to bed. We've just got to get rid of the monster. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. if it, there isn't a monster under your bed, you have to get into bed. You, you've been carrying on for far too long about there being a monster under your bed. You're just a silly little girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I, I, I certainly see as parents, you know, and you've said, you know, don't take on the blame. You know, we, we try our best and I agree. But I can still see lots of examples of where I could do things better in terms of allowing a child or my child to to yeah. release. And I guess what question I have now as a parent is, you oh, know, and you, yes, go on. Well, well, there's many, there's many questions that <laughs> so I could be here for a long time. But, but the first one is, um, you know, is that fear something that gets stored in the brain or the yeah. cells or what? What happens with that fear? Okay. What happens is our brain is geared for survival. Okay. Our brain is geared to get us through life. That's, that's nature. That's Darwinian theory, whatever you like. So we have two sides to our brain, simplistically again. The left brain is the conscious brain. It develops when we're about the age of two. And that left brain is thinking, analytical, and 
the verbal, verbal brain. It's the speaking brain. Our right brain is our unconscious, emotional, creative brain. Our right brain is what we're born with. There's no left brain when we're born. It develops slowly as kids learn to speak. That's their left brain developing. As they learn to think, as they learn to be able to be aware, that's their left brain developing. So all, none of us remember what happens in our first year of life because it's in our right brain. In the right brain, we have a, we have a thing called the amygdala, which is like our fear center. And that is there because we have to react if anything frightening happens. So if, if we see, hear, smell, touch, taste, anything that is not okay, whether it's a hot stove, see a snake, right? Hear a car crash. Our brain immediately, the, the sense goes through our amygdala before it goes to any other part of our brain. So we react to a car crash before we think. So the thinking brain receives the signal five-eighths of a second after the amygdala. So if the amygdala thinks it's dangerous, if you see a stick on the ground and it's in the shape of a snake, you can go, it's a snake. And then you go, oh, I'm so stupid. It's not a bloody snake. That's the amygdala got that we reacted from the amygdala. The message went to the thinking brain who analyzed it and said, no, it's a bit of wood. We all do it, right? So yes, the amygdala is our fear center. If there is something which is a trauma, something which overwhelms our ability to adapt and so much cortisol is released. So will I go into this? I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. So much cortisol is released. Various parts of our brain are completely cut off at that moment. And the, probably the most important is the prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain. You know that I can't think, I can't think. It, it starts when you lose your car keys, doesn't it? Where am I? Where am I? I, can't, I where, and then someone says, just stop. Is where where did you put them? Oh, that's right. They're on the. <laughs> As we release cortisol, we are less and less able to think clearly. Okay, so that part of the brain disengages when we have trauma. I'm going off the point. Let me go back to the point. So all fear, which is overwhelmed, is stored permanently in the amygdala until we release that fear. Mm -hmm. And whenever we are reminded of that trauma, because it's life threatening. The amygdala goes straight back into our fight, flight, freeze response, which is what we call triggering. So yes, we do store fear that we perceive as life-threatening and we store it in our unconscious. So we, that's why we don't know when we're triggered what it relates to. Mm. See what I mean? So go yes. back to the spider, you know, it, no, there was no way my grandson could know it was because of what happened. Yeah. Okay, so there's no like hoodoo voodoo stuff with this. It's literally it's straight, straightforward scientifically. Any neuroscientist will absolutely endorse everything that I'm saying. There is, oh. there, this isn't a theory. This is now known. This is what happens. I'm saying it simplistically because the brain obviously has all sorts of different bits. I'm talking about the principal organs that are involved mm. because there's no point in trying to say, you know, the hypothalamus and it goes into the, because I'm just giving it in simple, but simplistically, or when trauma occurs, the brain stores that whatever happened in the right brain and it reacts every time it sees that again. But whenever we are frightened by something, that's our right brain, we say, I feel frightened. We're connecting to our left brain, where Broca's area is, our speech center. And that then immediately deflates the fear. Mm -hmm. So if someone who's really raging, if they just say, I feel so angry, they actually, they lessen their anger. But if they're really raging and someone says, calm down, or get, then, then the rage gets bigger and bigger. But if someone says, let go of that anger, and they throw a cushion, they get rid mm. of the anger. It's, for all of us, it's allowing ourselves to acknowledge our feelings and not hold them in. Mm. And a lot of our, what happens when we're children is it's, don't be frightened. No, you don't be so angry. I will not have you shouting. Don't be this, you know. Um, it's a natural way because parents don't want their children to feel fear or anger or even sadness. It's like, don't cry, darling. I'll get you another toy. We should be saying, it's okay. It's sad you've lost your toy. It's okay. Let's let go of that sadness. Just sit, sit there and cry until you've let it all go. Mummy will come back. 
And, you know, three minutes later, the kid will be up running around and won't give a stuff about the toy. But instead of which we say, don't worry, darling, mommy, I'll get you another toy just the same. We'll go to the shops this afternoon. So the kid doesn't release their fear, sadness. <laughs> so well, it's weird that it's a subtle thing that most of us do as mums. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And so really what I guess what I'm hearing is allowing, letting go, honouring it, really just sitting in it and releasing it is the way through. Exactly. Mm. And they say that depression is the suppression of anger. Mm. Depression is definitely the suppression of emotions. And there are so many people in this world suffering with depression and anxiety and... and Anxiety. What's well, anxiety? It's another word for fear. Anxiety is fear. Trying not to say it's fear. Oh, I am so anxious. You, you, what you actually mean is I'm so frightened. You don't, don't even want. You're frightened of using the word. I'm so anxious about my interview this afternoon. I'm so frightened about my interview this afternoon. I just breathe out that fear. Let it go. Let it go. It's okay. It's not. The, the person isn't going to be nasty. No. Oh. You may still be releasing because you're still being frightened because there's a whole lot of other stuff happening, but it's acknowledging we're always mm. listening. And I, and I see that, you know, a lot of people and myself included, we're constantly rushing and we barely give ourselves time to acknowledge. That's okay. part of the huge problem, isn't it? We just don't slow down enough to sit there and go, like I know one of my biggest triggers is, is running late. I am constantly getting triggered over running late. I have this almost like a fear, a, an, a, an irrational fear about running late. To which I'd say to you, what happened when you, when you ran late when you were a child? See, I don't remember that. That, do, that doesn't. Or, or did your mother run late? Or if it's a real trauma, you won't remember, but you could easily ask Demi. She yes. Your process with you and you would discover what it was because anything like that, it will be because either you were late and something happened. If it's a real trauma, you're not going to be remember. Mm. If it's just because your mother was always late or whatever, then you would be answering me right now. Mm. Wow. Then, so you've, got, you've got a thing that's irritating. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Because it, it, it does start to take its hold where, you know, I do a lot of work on myself and I try to be very conscious, but that is the one thing that always gets me. It always is my undoing because it's, it's, as such a stress for me. I'm, 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 I'm actually early to everything because I, then my nervous system can't seem to handle running. <laughs> definitely, definitely, Nicole. Uh, definitely. Do it. And then you'll go, then you'll get it. You'll go, oh my God, I've been <laughs> stressing the last however many years about running late and I could have done this 10 years ago and my life would be different. You know, I, I get a lot of visuals when I'm talking to people and, and the visual I get when I'm talking to you is almost like the whole world taking a big deep breath in and just releasing a whole shitload of burden and crap and trauma, excuse my language. Really? I just feel like it's, it's almost that simple, you know, just to be able to release it. I know, I know. I know if schools were with all these kids who are suffering from, from the pandemic, if they would all just go, okay, let's just do some mindfulness let's just let's let's just all write about how how awful it was how scary it was let's just all get rid of the fear of what of of the pandemic mm. and you know whatever whatever it, it is but the whole world still is carrying everything about the pandemic like this aren't they and what would you say to to those people because i ha i hear the the skeptics and the people who find things you know very challenging and they they i can almost hear them saying it can't be that simple I just said, oh, just try it. So that's what I'm saying to you. Just try it. I'm suggesting something and people can try it or not try it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, um, you know, maybe it doesn't work for everyone. I'm, yeah. I don't, I'm not saying, I'm just saying this is what I've found. And it, over 30 years, I've found it's utterly, utterly life-changing for people of their, um, of, of their triggers. Um, and it's so give it a go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just say, I feel frightened and just see if you feel better. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I was taken by the. British government very wisely realized that all their prisoners, they're really hardcore prisoners who were bashing up and doing terrible things, that they all suffered from trauma. So they thought, okay, well, what we might do is have a special trauma wing in their highest high security jail. So they, I was asked to go over and train the psychologists and the prison officers and the prisoners. So I, so I'm, 
I took with me a guy, a really big guy who was an ex-prisoner who had been on our program because I knew they wouldn't listen to me, a middle-class white woman. And so I'd go in and there were all these 30 oh, big, mostly um, different, different nation, massive different nationalities anyway. They're all sitting like this, you know, oh yeah. Here we go, another, you know, fucking woman coming here to tell us, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I'm talking about detriggering and how you detrigger someone. And one guy's sitting like this and I said, can I just try it on you? And he said, oh, all right. I said, okay. So I just said, can you just tell me what you're feeling? I'm just being pissed off what I'm doing here. And what's under being pissed off with being here? You know, I'm angry. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, and anyway, I got him in the end to say, uh, I may even just, I may have even just had on the anger. Come on. Anyway, I said, just, can you just, just let go of that anger? So anyway, he did. And it was really funny. And there was this sort of silence. And they were all kind of watching. And he suddenly went, I'm feeling better than I ever felt in my life. Did you just do, woman? It was the funniest. And it's this, this big guy. And, I, I, and then I had all the guys. They were all kind of, what do you do with that guy? What? what? Because it is, it is, if someone do, is triggered in front of me and I de-trigger them, they feel the result instantly. And then, then, then the, wow. best, the rest of the time, they were all, all in, into it, except a couple of guys who's, who would not accept that they weren't guilty of the, the abuse they suffered as kids. Oh, okay. one guy mm. Couldn't accept that he was a victim and that he could heal because he said the man who sexually abused him was running a, a sweet lolly and his mum had always said, don't take sweets from a stranger. No, he didn't. He's the only person who didn't come back in the afternoon because he just felt he wasn't worthy of it. It's the core of everything. All those prisoners, I mean, that's why they're spending all that money. They heal from their trauma. They won't bash up the prison officers. And I got the prison officers to admit that they often got triggered. And that's that. That's what, so one's angry and the other's angry. And, you know, and so I, I taught all them how to de trigger. I said, when, you, when you're about to bash up a prisoner, could you just go away and just say, I feel frightened, I feel angry, and I'm just going to let it go. And then I'll deal with the prisoner. So I want to learn more. How do I learn more? <laughs> Where do you live, Nicole? I'm in Torquay in Victoria. You're in Victoria. Well, I mean, I, two days ago I was doing training. Are you, are you a therapist or, or are you? A... I don't know what you would label me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a therapist by train. No, the, no. the answer is um, I do training on, on all levels and you can always, if, you can, if, if there was some trauma in, in your childhood, the best thing to do is to come and do a healing week, actually, because then you, 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 you get it and then you want to learn more. Mm. And we have people who, who do, and that's what's so wonderful. So mm. come, and, come, and, come and join us, come and, come and try. Um, do a Zoom with Demi since, uh, and uh, process your always being anxious yeah. about being late. Yeah. And then you'll realize it's, it's, this stuff is really, really important. It is, and world. and it sounds so empowering and so simple, and like the solution is just in front of us. So exactly, that's absolutely amazing. I, I'm aware of the time. I know you have to go very shortly. I just wanted to ask you. I normally do a quick fire round of five questions, but because you're in a rush, I'm just going to give you one. Okay, give me one. <laughs> if you could wave a fairy wand, what would you change about the world? Oh, well, I would change the lack of recognition that anger uh, and fear create war. You know, look at our wars going on at the moment, it, it, particularly in the Middle East. It's hundreds, it's hundreds of years, generations of um, anger at each mm -hmm. other. If they could all be like Nelson Mandela did in South Africa and just say, let's just take a deep breath, which is what he did, Nelson Mandela did in South Africa, they forgave and, and let it go and therefore everyone could move forward. So if I could change the world, it would be more, more love, less fear. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Pleasure, Nicole. Lovely to talk to you. Sorry that I've been in a rush. Not at um, all. What I run, it's called the Heal for Life Foundation. So do check out my name or check out Heal for Life um, and do buy any of the books that I've written or just get, get, get involved and just if it's right for you, just reach out and reach out for help so that you can actually move on in your life because being stuck is something none of us should be through our lives. Thank Thanks you so much. Girl. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, that was absolutely amazing. And here's the takeaways. 
Childhood trauma can be the perception of life-threatening moments when, as a baby, they perceived danger. Say a mother leaving the baby in a crib and the perceived danger that results, real or not. Examples include abandonment or forced separation from a primary caregiver, divorce, neglect, bullying, death of a parent or sibling, abuse, and serious childhood illness or accidents. As a parent, we can support our children in releasing these fears and angers now so that they don't build up into larger, more impactful triggers. We need to allow our children to sit in the anger or fear, to realize it, release it, and let it out of the system. As our brain is geared for survival with a left side, which develops as we start talking and thinking, and a right side, which is unconscious and creative, and there from the very beginning, and our right side is our amygdala, which is our fear center. And when we are overwhelmed as a baby or child, cortisol is released and we can't process or think clearly. And this fear can be carried throughout life. But when we release that fear, even if it was from childhood, we can let it go. Now, based on the latest trauma recovery and neuroscience research, Liz's studies show that trauma causes involuntary emotional responses that often underpin challenging behavior in children and in teens. And simply by honoring, releasing, letting go, we can remove and release the trauma and the emotion. When we hold fear in our brain, in our amygdala, when we face a reminder of that fear, even as adults, whether conscious or not, we relive that feeling of that moment and of that trauma, hence our trigger and our fight or flight. For many children who experience emotional or behavioral difficulties, behaviors are an outward display of difficult emotions such as fear, anger, and shame that are caused by the neurological, neurobiological damage of trauma on the brain. So thanks for listening today, everybody. Please do check out Liz's groundbreaking work. Lots of love and remember, you are loved and you are worthy. Lots of love.